We've been talking about the provisions of God, talking about the gifts of the Spirit. We did four weeks on the gifts. We're in week number three of the fruit of the Spirit. There's more gifts. There's more fruit. And then we'll have four weeks of armor. The gifts of the Spirit are for the building up of the church, for the edification of the church. And the fruit is for the multiplication, for the evangelism, for the reproduction. That's the purpose of fruit. And then the armor is for the engagement of the church as we suit up and we move into our homes and our neighborhoods and into our community with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our church is supplied all of these things by a loving Heavenly Father who knows what we need and when we need it. It's why we pray. It's why we keep coming back again, because this is the kind of God that we want to follow. Now, I am very often reminded in my own thinking, not by other people, but I see that out there too, but I always want to preach the gospel. I always want you to know that your salvation comes by Jesus Christ alone, and that when God created us, He created us good. When we got a choice about it, we chose bad. We broke the relationship, but God put it in play that that relationship be restored. I will always preach a strong and clear gospel good news of Jesus Christ. But when we think about God, and when we hear people preach, sometimes all I hear from some is just feel-good sermons. You know, here's five points on happiness in life, and here's five points in ways to make your family stronger, and here's seven points of how to pay off your mortgage early. Whatever. I hear these sermons, and I'm wondering, what do these have to do with God? So I've always kind of maybe pushed too far the other way, and I always want to always, always, always present a strong presentation of God in our worship times, in my teaching. And then we come across these words in Scripture that challenge us in the way we think about God. Because sometimes we have to think differently. So I have these two questions up there. Ever judge a book by its cover? You know that phrase? Can a plant or tree bear fruit that's not in and of itself? First question, ever judge a book by its cover? Well, we know what this means, and we know someone or something, we know that we have done this before. We've made snap judgments. We've, you know, tried to get the, get the inside scoop on something before we actually know what it is. And so we try to judge a book by its cover, and when we think of God, what an amazing cover to look at, but His appearance Sometimes we try to let His appearance in our mind's eye, this picture that we have of God, be defined by His attributes and characters. These things that we're seeking or that we're experiencing of God at that moment seem to color the way we see a picture of God. Is He sweet? He's got a kindly face? Got a nice long beard? Kind of, kind of an old man? Kind of looks kind of grandfatherly? Or is he like that God with the thumb down on us? Is he the God that judges us? Is he the God who is angry? And I just picked out, you know, four little pictures to look at because sometimes we just don't quite know how to, how to see God. But we try to judge a book by its cover. Does a plant or tree bear fruit that is not of itself? Naturally, God designed things to be just that evident. Orange tree bears oranges. A strawberry tree bears strawberries. I know, I was teasing. But everything comes from the root, from the stalk, from the body, and shows up. So when God lists the fruits that He's giving us, these things reflect Him. When He gives us gifts, 
He gives us things that He has. You can't give a gift that you don't own, right? It's not polite to give a gift that you don't own. Otherwise, I would have Mary Kay give me a gift of a 1921 Honda Accord that's just being kept for me on the showroom floor. Can't do that. In the same way, you can't bear fruit that is not reflective of the tree, the bush, the plant that it comes from. So these different fruits of the Spirit are all present within God, and He gives these to us because He has them within Himself. Now, this is a long introduction, but we're going to be looking at the fruit of gentleness today. And this is not a fluffy sermon about, you know, woo wah wah God's, God's all cool and sweet and, you know, kindly and all that. But sometimes I need to stop. I just need to stop and remember that God is kind, that God is gentle, that God loves me. These are the three fruits that we've looked at so far. Brandon preached on the love of God the other day. Last week, I talked about the kindness of God. Today, the gentleness. Next week, the goodness of God. Isaiah 42, chapter 1. This is where we're going to start today, looking at the fruits of God and gentleness in particular. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my scripture upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Again, in the fullness of his character, let's see gentleness. His task at hand in this verse is very clear. Bring forth justice. My servant that I have chosen will bring forth justice. That's where it begins. And he's not going to be He's not going to be noisy about it. He's not going to be rough about it. He's not going to be brash about bringing forth justice. Do we or do we not need justice to come forth in this world today? Yes. In so many different areas. In so many different areas, we need the justice of God's righteousness to be pervasive within our society, within our homes, within our schools, within our government, just everywhere. We need the justice of God. And yet, he's not going to come at us with a big stick. He's going to come in with gentleness. Not noisy, not heavy-handed. Gentle. But the good news here in this particular verse is that he's going to finish what he started. Notice, if you would, it begins with my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. It ends with... And he will faithfully bring forth justice. What he begins, he's going to finish. We can believe this. We can hold this close. And he's going to do it with gentleness. That's maybe not the way we want to do justice. That's maybe not the way that I would first choose to do justice. To bring forth such a thing. But his chosen one that he will uphold. And he's not going to hurt those who are weak. He's not going to hurt those who maybe only have a little faith or a little hope. He's not going to break off the bruised reed. He's not going to snuff out the smoldering wick of a candle. If all you have is a little bit, that's all you need to feel His gentleness in your life. And He's going to move very consistently in us and through us if we allow Him to be gentle in our world. And He wants, He desires, He is going to accomplish the plan because His authority 
This is God, the Lord God Almighty that we've been singing about. His authority is behind His gentleness. I was talking with George the other day. George is in the hospital. He's had major surgery that went very well. And George Lackey is just amazing. He's sitting there, and he's just laughing and talking with me, and he's hoping to go home by next weekend. And we're talking about, because George likes to get up and work out every now and then. And he, up until this thing hit him, he was vigorous. And we were talking about, you know, that picture of this amazing, strong guy. I don't think there's a father out there in the history of the world who, when they have had a little baby born, holds that baby. I think, I think we all do this. We hold that baby, put their head right here, put their little body right here, and just look at them and let them, you know, we got to look me in the face here. Come on. And we just talk to our child and we hold them in them. But you know, the picture I like is when I see one of those great big weightlifter guys with arms as big as my legs, you know, just powerful arms holding this little tiny newborn. And I think, what a good picture of the strength of God and the gentleness of God. And I keep that in my mind. He shares a sense of this provision, His gentleness, even with us, His children. Yeah, this fruit that He hangs in our life so that He can draw other people to Him. He desires to hang gentleness from you to attract others. Even in Proverbs 15, he gives you a simple, simple trick to do gentleness. He just simply says, a soft answer turns away wrath. In some translations, it actually reads, a gentle word turns away wrath. And we need to try that. We need to try that at work when the first thing we want to do is yell at someone. We need to try that at home when the first response we want to have is a little aggressive. Maybe we need to be soft with our words, gentle with our words. Now, I don't know what I was going through this week to make me want to do this. Hang on. Jesus is tenderly calling thee home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love wilt thou roam farther and farther away? Calling today, calling today. Jesus is tenderly calling, he's calling today. Great old hymn, right? Isn't that just gentle? Isn't that just soothing? Another one. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, He's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner, come home. I don't even sing in the shower. And yet I'm standing up here and on the internet and all this stuff. But I want you to see, we sing about the gentleness of our Savior who calls us so tenderly, so sweetly, just come home to be with us. And this trait of God, this gentleness of God, this amazing fruit that He puts upon us to be loving, to be kind, to be gentle, this isn't hidden like some cosmic treasure hunt out there. God didn't say, oh, you might stumble across a little of my gentleness every now and then. God's gentleness is 
just so apparent. And we, as His children, need to let that gentleness be so easy in our lives. Because sometimes we just need to hear Him call us to come back to Him. Matthew 11, beginning at verse 27, says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light." That's such a great verse. That's such a great verse. First, it starts with these two words, all things. Now, let's define this a little bit. How many things have been handed over to Jesus by the Father? Most things in your life, right? How many things have been handed over to Jesus by the Father? Let's, some things that you're willing to, to share with you? No all things. You know how you define the word all in other languages? It means all. This is pretty easy. In the entirety of things, they have all been handed over to Christ by the Father. And here's the really good part. Who can know the Father? Who can know the Son? Jesus says that anyone can know the Father that He chooses to reveal Him to. Well, that sounds kind of selective, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You can know the Father. You can know God and His gentleness, and His strength. If Christ chooses to reveal God to you. John recorded a conversation that Jesus was talking about heaven and how, you know, He goes to prepare a place for you and in the Father's house are many mansions and all these things, and He's telling that I've got a place for you to come and dwell with God. And when He says this, He's also saying He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life. This is the Son of God, mighty in nature, mighty in character, amazing in all that He is. And He says, and I've prepared a place for you to come and stay with me and the Father. And at one point, Jesus tells His followers, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. For now, from now on, you know Him and have seen Him. Jesus reveals the Father to us. One of the disciples said, well, what, you, when are you going to show us the Father? And he's like, you're looking at Him when you see me. When we pursue Jesus, we are able to see God in all of His glory, in all of His splendor. We are able to see God. The Father has been revealed to us. Pardon me one more time. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us. For our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are calling us home, purchasing us with His very own blood, and He calls us, He leads us. Psalm 23, this business of His gentleness, we best see in this idea of a shepherd, okay? Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He leads me. He leads me to lie down. He leads me to be restored. He leads me 
in his righteousness. And he does it like a shepherd. Shepherds walk in front of the flock and the sheep follow them. They don't herd them. They just go and the sheep follow. That's pretty gentle. And he only takes them where they need to go. Occasionally you get that one out of a hundred that gets lost and he has to go look for them because they didn't follow. If you follow the shepherd, he'll provide for you. And he'll do it in such a gentle way. Isaiah 40, 11. And remember, he, he, he leads us because it honors his own name for his name's sake. Isaiah 40, 11, He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs of, in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. You know, when they vetted David to go and, and fight Goliath, here's this little shepherd boy shows up, got lunch for his brothers, and then Goliath is down there in the valley challenging all the army of Israel to a duel, and nobody wants to go because they're all afraid of this big giant of a man. And David says, I'll go. And when they bring him before the king, what's your qualifications? Let me see your resume. And David said, well, I killed a lion when he threatened my sheep. I killed a bear when he threatened my sheep. I'm a shepherd. Oh, okay, you can go. <laughs> you know, I'm a shepherd. Really? Is, is that the kind of qualifications we want for a warrior? Yes. Yes, it is. If you need it, you got it. Kill the lion, kill the bear, lead the sheep beside the still water. Hold the little ones in your arms. We even see stories in Scripture where the sheep are so beloved by the family that it's treated like a pet instead of just an animal by the children. And when it's lost to the neighbor, judgment comes. The, the idea of how much God's gentleness just surrounds us like his big old arms. His big old arms. His big arms surround us with gentleness. I'm going to read another passage to you. And I'm going to try to read this as dramatically as I can. This is when I could call on the spirit of Ron Robbins and his big voice when he used to read things for us at different presentations in the church. This is from Psalm 18. It's 19 verses. Stay with me as I go through these. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me, and the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, and to my God I cried for help. From His temple He heard my voice, and my cry to Him reached His ears. Now see how this changes. Here's the psalmist crying out to God, and it reached his ears, and this is where it changes. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down, thick darkness under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew, and he came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, Thick clouds, dark with water, out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. And the Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils." That's a big God. And He sent from on high. He took me 
He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support, and He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because He delighted in me. There, with that phrase, the rest of the chapter goes back on the psalmist. The rest of it looks like this is how he sees God's delight in him. This mighty God with huge power, huge strength, huge abilities comes and defeats the foes, cleans up the bad guys, those who would be a danger to his child, And this mighty God with thunder and lightning and and wind and rain and all of this stuff that just terrified the people of Israel when they were out there along the mountain and Moses was up there talking to God and they just didn't want to go close. This God let him out, delivered him from those that would come up against him like a shepherd would be gentle. He delighted in me. Wow. Can I tell you something? This is no secret, but sometimes you need to be reminded. God delights in you. You need to think about that. You need to hold on to that tightly on those days when you feel so beat up and tired. On those days when your prayer requests are for healing and deliverance and strength and all this kind of stuff, on those days, you need to remember that phrase, He delights in you. And His gentleness is going to just lead you and call you to Himself. And you know the really good news about this? It's not all about you. It's all about the people around you. They know what you're going through. Your family, your friends, they see what you're going through. And when they see within you this spirit of gentleness, that the strong, mighty arm of God is drawing you forth, but with gentleness, they're going to just like be bewildered. They're going to go like, what is going on? And where can I get me some of that? And that's the question. Fruit, the purpose of fruit, is reproduction of the tree. This fruit comes from God. And the purpose of it is that God be reproduced in the lives of people around you. Because God not only delights in you, but He delights in them as well. And we have to remind ourselves. In Second Kings, I'm sorry, First Kings, chapter 19. There's been a lot going on here in the previous chapter. Elijah has been called out by God to go up on the mount and do battle with, have a big contest with all the prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal, this idol that has been tempting the children of God away from God and drawing them away and and causing all kinds of havoc in the world. And so God sends Elijah to go have a little showdown. And on the mountain, God wins. Mount Carmel, here's the place. God wins. It's amazing. Go read about it. It's in chapter 18 in 1 Kings. Chapter 19, though, right in the middle of the chapter, after Jezebel, after hearing about all her prophets of Baal being killed, has pronounced the death sentence to Elijah, I won't kill that guy. And Elijah, after seeing all the power of God, goes, ooh, he gets scared and runs off. And he's hiding in a cave. God shows up, and he says, basically, what are you doing here? 
Let me read it to you in his words. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke to pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. One writer even called it a thin silence. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his faith in his cloak and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? Why are you threatened by Jezebel? You saw my power. You saw my strength. You saw my love for my people. What are you doing here, hiding in a cave? But instead of calling him out with thunder, an earthquake, storm, fire, he called him out in a gentle word. And he led him out of the cave. And he sent him. From this point, he sends him out. He said, you don't have time to sit here. Let me show you what you're going to do next. You're going to go anoint this guy as king over here, this guy as king over here. I've got you a, a replacement prophet to come in after you. Go find him. And I will do my will in the life of my children. Now go. Get busy. All of this in the still smallness of his voice to a prophet who had seen many things in his life but needed to be reminded. And God chose the best way to remind him in that current situation was with gentleness. Hmm. You're not going to stand alone, Elijah. 7,000 other people in Israel who've not bowed to Baal. You're not by yourself. Church family, you're not by yourself. God loves you so much. God provides for you so much. God cares for you so much. He is delighted in you. That should do something right here for you. The other day I was over at Brandon's. He and Candace are moving from one location to back to Northside, and I was helping them move some things over. And we were sitting at the back picnic table behind his house having our staff meeting. And as we talked... Candace shows up, and she's got their little one, John, with them. And John had been to a therapy session that he goes to with her from time to time. And that day, John was having none of it, okay? He was just like, mm -mm, we're not into this at all, Mom. And so she had her hands full, and she had had a long day with him. And so when they came walking up, and you could kind of see John just kind of struggling to get away. Where's he going? But he just wanted to get away. I thought... I'm a nice guy. I, I can help here. I'm a pretty good dad, and I'm an Olympic-style grandfather. And so I offered, come here, John. Let me hold you. Let's give Mom a break. John, in all his wisdom, looked at me with a great deal of suspicion, and then he looked over at Brandon and a big old smile came on his face. And he went, let me go to Dad. Because he knew instinctively, he knew who loved him more and would care for him the best. Don't go to some stranger, even though the interest may be there, even though the invite might be there, even though the skills might be there, kind of. Don't go to some stranger. Go to the Father who loves you. Brandon didn't have to say anything. He just smiled silently. And John was drawn to him. Your God is smiling at you now. He's with you now. He's here now with us. 
Do you hear him? In the silence, in the quiet, do you hear him? He loves you. He's delighted in you. And he will be gentle with you. And sometimes you just need to be reminded. Sometimes you just need to know this God who created everything, this God who said, this is good and this is the way I want it to be. Here's my creation and I want to be with them. And this God who even watched us turn our backs on him and walk away and choose over and over and over again not to be with him, choose over and over again to just throw ourselves into all kinds of things besides him. This God who sent his son, because there was going to be a consequence for my action, there's going to be a consequence for your action, and I can't do anything to change that, but Jesus did. Jesus from the cross said, it's finished. I don't think he yelled it out, it's finished! I think he just simply quietly said, it's finished. And the gentleness and the power of our Savior saved us because He delights in you. The invitation today, I was kind of wrestling with this one. What am I inviting them to? What am I inviting them to? Well, as always, I invite you to Christ. If you don't know Him as your Savior, I would love to introduce you. I would love to walk with you through the Scripture. I would love to share with you the truth of this. That Even though it sounds, for some it sounds too complicated, for some it sounds too simple. So I hope I can share it in such a way with you that it sounds right. But some of you just need to be invited into the gentleness of God in your life today. This is a fruit that He desires to hang in your life. His gentleness so that you can then be gentle in His place with those around you. Would you like that? Would you desire that? His love, His kindness, His gentleness, these are what He has for you so that He can be reproduced in the life of those around you but you get to enjoy him as he's working on that. You get to enjoy his fruit hanging in your life as he's working to reach others. May we do that as a church. Father God, today as we draw this worship time to a close, let us not draw our hearts to a close. Let us see you busy in our lives. Let us know your busyness in our everyday activity so that we can, Father, somehow sense your gentle Spirit leading us beside the still water, delivering us from those who would harm us, being close to us, as close as a whisper. And when we're confused about what we're supposed to be about, as a people, Father, just come and whisper to us, what are you doing here? I delight in you, and I have things, I have things for you to do. Lord, let us respond to your leading. Let us respond, Father God, to your movement in our hearts right now. and through the days of the week to come. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be here if you'd like someone to pray with. There's a lot of people out there if you'd like someone to pray with. It's 
It's a joy and a privilege as a pastor to get to stand down here and receive. But I'm willing to share that joy. I want to share that, that happiness that I feel when someone comes to me and says, could you pray for me? Could you hear my story? Could you walk beside me? I will gladly share that with you. So if you would be more comfortable going to someone else, please do. Just get up and go. Don't fight it. Go to Jesus. Let him guide you. Let him lead you home.